there are some questions that we can disagree on and it doesn't really matter. The Sasquatch comes to mind. Next year will mark the 50th anniversary from that original famous footage. People look at the same video evidence and come to different conclusions. One person looks at the video of Bigfoot and concludes that he exists, and another person looks at that same video of Bigfoot and concludes that the Bigfoot they're looking at does not exist. Another person, Mitch Hedberg, has offered his thoughts for what is an intriguing alternate view. I think Bigfoot is blurry, and that's the problem. It's not the photographer's fault. Bigfoot is blurry, and that's extra scary to me. There is a large, out-of-focus monster roaming the countryside. <laughs> so that's one view. Well, however controversial, the question of Bigfoot is not consequential. It is not a big deal. We shouldn't lose sleep over it. But there are some questions that are consequential, questions that are a big deal. Questions that we should not sleep until we have settled. And the trick in life is to get the right questions in the right order and to take the right questions seriously. Well, this morning's passage tells the story of no small controversy over no small or inconsequential question. It's a question concerning Jesus Christ. A question which will end with some utterly rejecting Jesus and one worshiping him. And it's a question which is not theirs only for that time, but which is for ourselves this morning, today, just the same. So let's read together John chapter 9. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. And others said, No, but he's like him. He kept saying, I'm the man. So they said to him, Well, then how are your eyes opened? And he answered, The man called Jesus, made mud, and anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, Where is he? And he said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who's a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that the man had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how does he see? And his parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? 
And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, and we're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he's come from. And so the man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone's a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into the world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. Two points about the setting will be important up front. The first point is the time. This takes place the morning after a week of a Jewish feast in view of two great torches that would have lit the temple area at night on the nights before where there would have been dancing and celebration. Right there in this discussion of light and blindness and darkness are two great torches that have lit the night to this point. That's the time. The second tension. It's in the air and the tension is thick. John 9 comes after eight chapters of escalating conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees, that group that claimed religious authority over the Jewish people. In chapter 8, Jesus said all kinds of provocative things. He said that he is the light of the world and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. And the Pharisees heard him rightly as suggesting, even saying, that they walk in darkness. And the Pharisees heard him right when they heard him say that Abraham wasn't their father, but your father is the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. They were rightly angered at that. Lest you thought this was a nice isolated healing story, notice the verse at the very end of chapter 8. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. They pick up stones. Jesus heals a blind man. This is a provocation. This is a fight. And we'll see how it works out in due time. Our outline will unfold in three questions, one for each of three parts of the story. Three questions that move from inquiry to interrogation to invitation. Three questions that move from why to how, to who. First question, question about suffering. A question about suffering, verses one through seven. This is a why question, it's a simple inquiry. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? This is a question put to Jesus by his disciples. Perhaps they passed by this man and Jesus gave him some attention, which elicited a question from the disciples. So the disciples offer up a question about the age-old problem, the problem of pain. And this is a problem for all thinking and feeling human beings because we are human beings. We are not animals and we are not rocks. When a baby is born blind, we know that something has gone wrong. And a merely physical explanation is never satisfying. A mother of a baby born blind doesn't hear the explanation of what happened physically from a doctor and think, makes total sense. I can go on with my life now. My questions are answered. No, her grief means something. And we know that it points to deeper meaning. A truly naturalistic worldview will explain the mother's grief as an evolutionary development in service to the species. But we know, as a mother surely knows, that her baby is more than a ball of matter and her grief is more than efficient, impersonal programming. 
when the disciples ask Jesus about the man born blind, they assume what we intuitively know, that there is a deeper meaning underneath our suffering. Life is more than the physical. But that doesn't mean that all spiritual, deeper explanations are equal or right. Hinduism, for example, assumes a system of reincarnation where your life now is a consequence of a life previous. Suffering now, a consequence of sin in the past, whatever it may be called. The person born blind is getting what they deserve. And in, this is why in cultures that are shaped on the assumptions of this worldview, there are permanent castes where the poor and oppressed are presumably getting what they have coming. And there is no movement upward that would even be unjust. Well, the disciples are actually operating with a variation of this. They give Jesus two options. Look at the blind man. Who sinned? The blind man or his parents? And how could it be that the man sinned except that he sinned in the womb? And that is actually one of the conclusions that you might come to in first century Palestine, where a person born with an ailment could be understood to have sinned in the womb to incur it. Palestine, where there was a one-to-one sin-to-suffering correspondence as popular belief. Well, we can certainly understand this logic, and there's a reason this view is popular. Suffering needs an explanation, and sin needs justice. There is a preoccupation in our passage this morning with sin. Something like seven, eight, or nine mentions of sin and sinners, and, and what to do with it, and what it means, and what it deserves. So the solution has a kind of an appeal, like a bargain where two problems make a solution. Put them together and you have a solution to suffering, an explanation for suffering. You also have justice for sin. But it's not a very good solution. It doesn't actually do justice to human evil. And it doesn't actually satisfy us with respect to suffering. And Jesus doesn't like it. He answers their question by rejecting its premise. He rejects the tight connection between specific suffering and specific sin as an absolute principle. Verse 3, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. It was not the sin of any person, but it was God's sovereign purpose that explains this man's blindness from birth. Now, Jesus could have offered any number of biblical answers to their why question. The Bible and the Christian worldview offers us great resources with which to understand and to be comforted even in the face of all manner of suffering. Jesus could have said, don't you remember Adam? For all creation is under a curse because of sin. And in a real and general sense, every failing eye and blind eye is tied to sin's curse, which goes back to Adam. We were not made not to see. Eyes were made to see. Jesus is not denying this. He could have said, haven't you heard of Job? For the story of Job is given in our Bibles to address this very specific wrong assumption. It is true as a general principle that we reap what we sow. Much human suffering is because of specific human sin. And even in your own life, you can draw a line from someone's sin to your suffering or from your sin to your own suffering. But this is not an absolute principle. So much suffering is mysterious and inexplicable. And the Bible lets us say so. Oh, God has his purposes. But Job had no idea what those were. And he blessed the Lord still. Jesus is not denying this. Instead, Jesus simply answers, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We may not know the ultimate purpose of God for any specific sin, but we can know that God is ultimate, excuse me, suffering, but we can know that God is ultimate in all suffering. But Jesus did not come to walk around and to answer questions about sin and about suffering, important as they are. Jesus came to be our answer to sin and to suffering. And so he doesn't just answer their question. He says this, verse 5, I am the light of the world. 
I am the light of the world. Now, if you approach me or email me with a theological question, I will do my best to answer you from Scripture and to serve you. I will not say, I am the light of the world. And if you go to anybody with a question about sin or suffering or whatever, and in the mix, they let you know that they're the light of the world, run as hard as you can. The miracle and the controversy which follow will bear out exactly what Jesus means by this. Jesus spits on the ground and makes some mud with it, and then he puts his hands on the eyes of the blind man and tells him to go and to wash. Jesus didn't have to do this process, but he did. The man washes. He comes back seeing. Surely this man had tried it all. Some of you with ailments have received many suggestions. Who knows in the first century what was suggested to address this? So he tries it. Sure enough, Jesus has healed him. This man was born blind in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. And Jesus is only getting started. This is not actually the main work that God will display in this blind man's life. His seeing eyes are not just for him, but they are a sign to everyone of something greater God will do, which he will do in him. So the first question that we see in this passage for the first part is a why question. It's a why question. And Jesus' answer only raises other questions. There are some 20 questions in the whole passage, a ton of them. After healing, Jesus disappears from the scene. and He won't come back until the end. And the blind man returns to his neighborhood. I think that's the first place I'd go. I'd want to see what my joint looked like. And I want to see the neighbors that passed by me each day. His return raises a second question. And he will be pummeled with it. The first question we considered was a why question. And the second one is a how question. A how question. A question about a sign. Verses 8 through 34. In verse 10, how are your eyes opened? That's the one that everybody is asking. In fact, this is the question sustained across four progressive exchanges that we call this man's homecoming tour. He's going to make several stops for several exchanges, and this question will beat like a drum through them all. But it won't go as he might have hoped his homecoming return might have gone. Never has he likely received so much attention from so many people, and yet this is not going to be positive attention. It's not going to end well for him. Humanly speaking, the first exchange is between a man, the man, and his neighbors. The man and his neighbors. The neighbors are fascinated, but they're confused. They asked him how his eyes were opened, but only after bickering over whether this was even the same guy. Some said, this is the same man that used to sit and beg. And others said, no, but he is like him. Except, of course, this guy can see. And why would they debate this? Because people born blind die blind. You don't get unblind if you're born blind. No one opens your eyes to see. It doesn't happen. They're working out of their normal experience in life. It may also say something about how little attention people actually pay to the man. And if you know someone, you know him. And as they went back and forth, back and forth, we're told the man kept saying, I am the man. Guys, 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 it's me. It's me. And to their sensibilities informed by normal human experience, this was simply impossible. It could not be him. So they asked him, then how were your eyes opened? Easy. The man called Jesus, made mud, and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received my sight. Easy for him to say, hard for them to swallow. The man is giving them painfully little to work with. He didn't even know where Jesus had went. So his neighbors are fascinated, but they are confused. But this is not a Bigfoot sort of question, a simple curiosity. They need to settle this one, and so they take him to their religious leaders. And this leads us to the second exchange. A second exchange, this one between the man and the Pharisees. The man and the Pharisees. 
These guys will have an answer for sure. These are the spiritual elites, the one that supposedly know God so well and his scriptures. The neighbors may not know it, but the Pharisees know their Old Testament well and should know about very specific prophecies, for example, in Isaiah, concerning the Christ who is to come and concerning blindness and sight and light and darkness. The portrait of their coming Messiah was not blurry. They even had a preview reel in Isaiah to play. Consider these scriptures in Isaiah 42 verse 18. This is a description of the problem in Israel. The problem of sin was not resolved with God's old covenant. And so he speaks this way to him. Hear you deaf and look you blind that you may see. Who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one or blind as the servant of the Lord? He sees many things but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. He's using sight and hearing to get across the sense that they are dead, unfeeling, cannot perceive the Lord in sin. Isaiah 42, verse 6, we get a picture of the promise of hope to come. Same kind of language. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. How sweet. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. Isaiah 35. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. That that that. Uh, Then the lame man shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute shall sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. One of the verses from which we get the name of our church. The eyes of the blind will see, and the lame will leap, and the deaf will hear. The mute will sing. All of this is a way of saying that the Messiah will turn back the curse There will be a renewal of the earth and human bodies, but at heart, this is a picture of what God does spiritually in fixing the problem of human sin. And in the context of Isaiah, the big problem God is solving is the problem of that heart. Israel is blind and her leaders are blind guides, but the Messiah that comes will brighten their eyes and they will be the light of the world. This is what they were to expect. This is what the Pharisees would have known from their knowledge of Isaiah if they had eyes to see And yet the Pharisees only illustrate the problem Jesus came to save. And it's with the Pharisees that this perfectly legitimate how question is employed for a truly sinister interrogation to follow. The Pharisees, verse 15, asked him how he had received his sight, but they don't like his explanation. You see, the neighbors didn't like the story because it was physically impossible. The Pharisees don't like the story because in their view, what they're hearing is spiritually impossible. Here, John emphasizes the timing of the miracle. This was done on the Sabbath, something that goes against the Pharisees' application of Sabbath laws from the Old Covenant. This wasn't something that they would have allowed to happen. Jesus doing something with mud on the Sabbath day. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, why? For he does not keep the Sabbath. That's how we know. But others said, how can a man who's a sinner do such things? They insisted that that this man, Jesus, could not be from God. But even as they are sure Jesus is not from God, the man is getting clearer in his own mind as to who it was he encountered. As to who it was that had mud on his hands. And so when they ask him, He doesn't say the man named Jesus, which he said earlier. He says, he's a prophet. He is from God. He wasn't bothered by the Pharisees' concern. He wasn't intimidated. Perhaps he sensed that Jesus' timing was not a PR miscalculation, accidentally distancing himself and his message from a key marketing demographic, the Pharisees. Shoot, wrong day, the Sabbath. No, he perceived that this was a purposeful confrontation of their human system of self-salvation, which they had overlaid onto their Old Testament so that they saw this system of self-salvation in the text that wasn't there. 
and missed its main point. Perhaps this blind man had heard something of the ruckus that was going on the day earlier already. Heard Jesus say that they belonged to their father, the devil. Perhaps he was connecting the dots and remembered Isaiah and some things that he'd heard and what God had promised to do for blind eyes and he's seeing it now. And perhaps he knew that Jesus did this much the same thing in John chapter 5 where on the Sabbath, Jesus healed the blind and the lame. And the lame leapt and the blind saw. And so here God was doing it for him. The Pharisees don't believe his claim to have been born blind, so they seek out his parents. I mean, his parents will be able to verify that this is not their child. And so this brings us to the third exchange, an exchange between the Pharisees and the man's parents. How happy they must have been, if you could only imagine. They've seen their child, and now their child sees them. How deeply, deeply moving. But when they're asked how, they're conflicted. And their answer is calculated, and it's safe. They're fine to associate with their son, but they won't be on record associating with Jesus. They're fine to say that he was born blind, but they won't say how it is that he came to see or who it is that brought this about. They're not afraid to acknowledge the miracle, but they are afraid to speak of Jesus in connection with the miracle. And they're thankful, no doubt, for this miracle, but there are limits to this couple's thankfulness. In any case, the Pharisees have their answer. The man that is looking at them and the man that they're looking at was the man who was born blind, the son of this couple. And so what do they do next? With this information that we may assume they were seeking with proper motive, what will they do? Do they say, well, if he was blind and now he sees this is amazing, we were highly suspicious and for obvious reasons, but we needed to investigate it further. We can't give people sight, but we know of one in the scriptures promised who can, and maybe this Jesus is him. No, they don't say anything like that. And we might be tempted to think here that all they need is enough physical evidence that this man really was blind and then they would believe. Because we do this, don't we? We say, God, if you would show me, if I saw this, if I was there before the miracle, surely I would have enough to believe. We ask for this thing from God. But we're not as easily persuaded as we might ourselves think. We have prior commitments that we knowingly or unknowingly don't want to let go should we find the truth out. We would rather turn our head. We are, have personal investments in opposite answers, and that is the case here. You see, a greater hurdle for these Pharisees than the impossibility of Jesus' miracle is the inconvenience of Jesus himself. Which leads us to the fourth exchange, another exchange between the Pharisees and the man. Who cares what the parents said? The Pharisees know what they want. Verse 24, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. In other words, tell the truth and recant. Give glory to God, admit he's a sinner. Tell the truth, which he does not, that is, recant. In fact, he does the opposite. The Pharisees, the Pharisees are growing in their blindness. The Pharisees are growing in their rejection of Jesus. And all the while, here again, the man born blind is growing in his reverence for Jesus. In his sense that this is not just another man. So listen to this incredible dialogue. This blind beggar is no dummy with an arsenal of words and rhetoric, he answers them. He answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Well, there's that question again. 
like replaying the same footage over and over again and hoping that they see or hear something else. But this is not a blurry video. This is a public account of a man born blind given sight. And the burden of proof is on the Pharisees, not the man. And the man does not accept it. With holy impatience for this kind of nonsense, he says in verse 27, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why, do you want to hear it again? Do you want also to become his disciples? They're disingenuous and he calls them on it. And they reviled him, furious, saying, if you're his disciple, you are his disciple, we're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. And the man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they have nothing to say. And the man is right. In fact, to this day, if a person is born blind, they don't get sight later. We don't have an answer for that. The Pharisees have nothing to say. And so they say this. You were born in utter sin. And you would teach us. And they cast him out. Done with him. The man was born blind, but these Pharisees refused to see the truth. It is almost as if Jesus healed the blind man of his physical blindness in order to expose the spiritual blindness, which is what this is, of the Pharisees. And that is actually precisely what Jesus has in mind in his work with this blind man, man born blind. But thankfully, there is a message of blindness in Jesus' miracle that goes beyond merely speaking to the Pharisees' blindness, but offers the, us all here the hope of sight. We've heard a why question about suffering, and we've heard a how question about this sign, and now we have, and of course Jesus would lead us exactly here, and now we have a who question, a question about salvation, verses 35 through 41. We've moved from a simple inquiry to a sinister interrogation and now a sweet invitation. He can see now, but now he's cast out of the synagogue. Jesus hears of it and finds him. And Jesus does not apologize to him. Jesus does not console him. This was all by Jesus' design to make a point to and with the Pharisees' response. But this is what Jesus says to the man persecuted for association with Jesus. Instead, he asks him a really big question. And we ought to listen, for this is the question that's given for us to consider as well. What did Jesus say first upon seeing the man? Do you believe in the Son of Man? Verse 35. And he answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And the text says, he worshipped him. He worshipped him. Who does this? What good teacher accepts the worship of a pupil? What sane man accepts worship for himself as God? Except if this man is himself, God come down with us, God to save, God among us. For as this man born blind, for this man born blind, this is a bigger moment than the moment that he received sight, if you would consider that. It is a more pivotal moment in his life than the moment that he received sight. For it is here that he sees and comes to know more than the colors and the people and the sky, but the one who made all of these things. It's more important. It's also this moment where he says, I believe in worships. This is also a more impossible moment for us to imagine if we know reality as it is. And that's why we sing the call, song called Amazing Grace and not just grace, 
amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Quote, was blind, but now I see. And the author got Jesus' point exactly right. For in the healing of the blind man, surely Jesus had compassion on him, but Jesus' purpose was not even merely for him, but through him to demonstrate what God does for those who come to him with their need, knowing their blindness. And he worships. And so we sing, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And when do we first begin? When do we first begin worshiping and singing? It's at the moment of conversion when we say, I believe. And we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved son, from death to life. Not merely to sing and worship, but to live and worship unto Christ as this man does. Blind people can't heal their blindness we can't heal our sinfulness and that's why this is all of grace. The only thing that grace demands of us is that we know we need it. And this man does. And that's exactly the Pharisees' problem for they don't. In this healing, we have a picture of what God does in us. And this is the point. This is the great work of God that's displayed in the man that Jesus mentioned. And this is the same great work that God may be pleased to display in you this morning. And how do I know that? How can I say that? This is a story from 2,000 years ago that we're watching. Well, consider what John says is his reason for including this sign in his gospel. From John 20, verse 30, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, these signs are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That he's the Christ, the Savior come to live and die for his people. That he's the Son of God, that he is himself the Lord come down to get it done. And that by believing you may have life in his name. The sign wasn't just for the Pharisees. This actually was written by the Lord's Spirit for you and for me today. So God may not well remove your trouble in this life as he did so beautifully for the blind man. But there was never the point that he would do so. The purpose of this sign was always that you may believe and that by believing you may have spiritual sight and life to the full, life eternal. So some questions. Are you fascinated with Jesus though confused like the neighbors. Well, seek an answer like they did. Don't just move on from the question. Seek an answer to the question, but seek it where a real answer can be found in the very word of God. There are many blind guides out there. Are you like the parents in this story, fearful and conflicted? You know who Jesus is? He's just not worth it. He's too high a calculated risk. I don't think the point of their inclusion in this story in this way was to shame them or to make a point off them necessarily. But this side of the cross, Christians don't say, I don't know who Jesus is. Christians don't say, I don't know how it happened. Christians, without shame, associate themselves with Jesus in public ways that are often embarrassing. And it's one thing for a man to say, Jesus put mud on my eyes and healed me. It's another thing for us to say that God has given me eternal life and he did it through a Roman crucifixion 2,000 years ago. So rework your calculation in light of the cross. There on the cross, Jesus suffered for sin. And by hitching yourself to a crucified Savior, you will endure some embarrassment, maybe even great embarrassment in this world, but your sins will be removed and you'll have your Father's approvable, approval, a net gain, an immeasurable proportion. Or are you like the Pharisees, furious at Jesus and committed against him? And really, that's the main contrast in this story. The other characters are more on the side. The main contrast is between the blind and the seeing. And what the blind do when pushed to the wall with Jesus and what the seeing do. Trusting ourselves to resolve our own problem of sin before God and standing with him. Or trusting God to provide the solution in Jesus. 
Ultimately, when pressed hard enough, every person will either cast Jesus out or worship him. And Jesus is provoking this very thing. Remember his words at the end. For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see me may see and that those who see may become blind. If you were blind, you would have no guilt, he says to the Pharisees. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Those that say, I can see just fine, are actually blind. Those are the ones that say, I'm okay. My righteousness is good enough to meet God's approval. I don't need Jesus' death, his cross, his help. But those who say, I'm blind, give me sight. He indeed will give sight. And where does their guilt go? For their guilt doesn't remain on them. Well, this is where the story is going. For the hardness and the blindness of the Pharisees will pin Jesus right to a cross. No, nail Jesus right to a cross. A cross, And it's there that Jesus will bear the guilt of those who receive him and believe. So how do you know that you're not blind? How do you know that your guilt does not remain on you? Well, all of this will turn on what you see with your eyes when you look at the cross. And whether you see Jesus Christ shamed and hung and want your distance from that and from him. Or whether you see Jesus Christ, your savior, dying in love for your sins. The Pharisees were preoccupied with sin. Praise God that God is even more preoccupied with sin. And praise God that he has a solution that actually works. Folks, Jesus roamed the countryside to lift some of the language from the opening anecdote about the Sasquatch. Jesus roamed the countryside, but his message and his cross is not blurry. He presents us with the same big question he asked the man born blind. Do you believe in the Son of God? And I pray that your answer is his. I believe and I pray that you worship him for it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage in the Gospel of John. We thank you for the message that sinners who are dead can be raised to life, that sinners who are spiritually blind can be given sight if they will acknowledge their problem. Father, we thank you that you came for blind beggars such as us here this morning. May we believe on the Son Christ and may we worship him. Amen.